Good afternoon and welcome to our latest webinar. This afternoon we're going to be talking about water scarcity. Water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Ports infrastructure and water security. A look specifically at Nelson Mandela Bay Metro as the case study for risk and potential. And for the next hour, we're going to be discussing that with our panel of experts. I'm delighted to be partnering with the Nelson Mandela Bay Business Chamber of Events, and Lunga Sili will be giving us a short introduction later on. Uh, my old colleague, Ivor Gardner, who is now Director for the Middle East and Africa for Barrett Consultants, uh, a risk specialist, a crisis management specialist, an infrastructure specialist, and again, another old collaborator, co-collaborator, Ryan Ravens of Accelerate Cape Town, who is heavily involved in the day zero water crises as they happened. It would be remiss of me not to mention the events of the past week in South Africa, when we've seen our infrastructure, our fragile infrastructure, deliberately hijacked and attacked and looted. And I think as Chambers, the British Chamber of Business here in Southern Africa, and with our partner Chambers in Nelson Mandela Bay, it's important we stand tall and stand shoulder to shoulder with you in business, looking at how we start rebuilding and preventing further attacks on our infrastructure, but really looking at our sustainability and security. We're going to be talking uh, about these sustainability issues, infrastructure with the ports and our water stability. And I really do encourage you to interact using the Q&A function, uh, which you'll see on your screens. Please feed a question in, and my colleague Cecilia will feed that into myself and the panel. And also, we're going to be running some polls to uh, have a little bit of interactivity. So please participate fully when you see those polls come in on the screen. And as, before we kick off with our main subjects, I'd like to run a bit of an icebreaker. And the question I'm going to pose to you is, how much water security do you think South Africa enjoys compared to other African countries? Uh, so what I'll be saying, which country do you feel has the most water security? And Leslie in Mission Control, can we just queue up that first poll? We've had a couple of technical difficulties, so if that doesn't come up in a minute or so, here we go. Which country do you think has the highest ranking in terms of water security? Just answer as quickly as you can. And Leslie, once those results have come through in about 30 seconds, let's put those back on the screen. But really looking at Angolia, Ethiopia, Somalia, South Africa, which do you think has the most water security in terms of the, this critical resource and critical part of our infrastructure? Okay. I'm not sure if those results are gonna come through, but let me tell you some quite shocking statistics in that, oh, here we go. So in terms of highest rankings, a third of us think Angola, a, a third of us think South Africa, and then equally 70% think, 17% think Zimbabwe and Ethiopia. But what I'll tell you, which is a concern, and I'm sure the panelists will comment on, in terms of the, the, the South Africa finishes actually at the bottom there, with Somalia, Ethiopia, and Angola having greater water security. So it's really something that we need to consider and look at as a critical threat to our infrastructure and indeed our own sustainability. So I'm going to introduce our first structured topic today. We have two panelists from major SA port cities, uh, Cape Town and, and, uh, Peter, and Port Elizabeth, Quebec. GQ, I believe it's now being referred to. Ports are key strategic areas. And as we've seen over the last week in Durban, ports and supply chains can be targeted to cripple our supply chains across the country. Ports and aging infrastructures have long been a concern for us in South Africa. And weaknesses and challenges were laid bare and amplified starting last year with the, with the pandemic that is still raging today. In June last year, in the midst of the first wave of COVID, multinational shipping companies were starting to avoid Cape Town due to long delays caused by COVID. Both uh, MSC and One had removed Cape Town from their main shipping line and begun charging extra to deliver cargo to the port, having a major impact on our supply chains. Uh, they went on to stopped at Cape Town and to use smaller weekly routes for imports and chose to offload cargo at Coiga and Port Elizabeth, Quebec, and to move cargo to Cape Town on smaller feeder vessels. Again, a massive change in the supply chain and in the, in the logistics flow. Uh, Ryan, we're hearing of new ports and developments around Quebec and indeed Cape Towns, 
ports infrastructure is developing. Tell us a bit about the history of these two ports, uh, its challenges, and how ports have come since last year. What is changing? And by all means, for those of us that don't know Accelerate, give us an introduction to Accelerate Cape Town as well. Great to have you, Ryan. Sure. Hi, hi everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks, thanks for having me, Leon. It's always good to collaborate. Yeah, um, yeah Accelerate Cape Town is a business leadership organization in the Western Cape. Uh, we, we don't have BLSA, BUSA, or any of those organizations represented here. And so Accelerate Cape Town for the past uh, 16 years has served that function as the apex business leadership organization, serving predominantly corporates as opposed to SMEs and, and so on. Um, so that's a little bit about Accelerate. Um, on the Cape Town port, uh, quite interesting. I mean, Cape Town port is, is well known. It's, it's very well equipped uh, to provide service to a variety of sectors, you know, containers, general cargo, but predominantly fresh produce and fishing and also a growing offshore oil and gas industry. I, I do think though that with Saldana port sort of uh, starting to come online as, as a second deep water port, uh, a lot of the oil and gas industry activity will, will probably move a little bit up the coastline. And I think uh, Saldana very well positioned to, to service that industry. Um, I think predominantly, you know, fresh fruit, perishables, frozen produce uh, and so on, all being exported out of uh, the Cape Town port. What is interesting is the uh, expansion plan. So there's a very interesting expansion plan over the next 20 years and so for Cape Town Port, which includes a new breakwater, a new outwater basin with deep water berths, reclamation um, of, of some land to increase the land side container handling areas. And then also uh, there's significant uh, potential for liquid bulk terminals and berths as well. Um, so some interesting developments and, and of course just recently we launched the new cruiser, um, cruiser cruise liner terminal at Eberth at the v and waterfront. Um, so that was quite exciting, albeit you know at a very unfortunate time when we don't exactly have too many cruise ships and tourists visiting, but nevertheless uh, a very, very important investment in infrastructure um, servicing the tourism sector. Um, so, so that's all good stuff, but I think what has been concerning for us very recently has been a, a recent World Bank report, which listed the port of Cape Town as one of the worst ports in Africa. Um, really? Fortunately, that has attracted the attention of national government and uh, President Ramaphosa was recently in Cape Town and made a very interesting pronouncement that um, the National Ports Authority is going to be spun out of Transnet as an independent subsidiary. So this is a, a very positive step in the right direction, we believe, with respect to uh, getting our ports better operating. Uh, certainly what we would like to see as, as big business is for government to go an extra step and possibly consider operating concessions for our infrastructure such as ports. So, you know, by all means, uh, government should own that infrastructure, but allow private concessionaires to, to crowd into that space and operate that infrastructure far more efficiently. You know, I think um, it's concerning that we have reports of, of vessels waiting up to 12 days in the port of Cape Town yeah. um, to be serviced, which is obviously not ideal for, for a major hub like uh, Cape Town. But um, we look forward to the developments and we'll be tracking the, the NPA um, spin out quite, quite closely and, and obviously standing by to assist wherever possible and get involved as, as private business. And it's interesting, you mentioned the cruise liner ships there, and obviously we had the Suez Canal blocked for, for several weeks to the tune of however many billion dollars per hour. We saw ships being rerouted around the Cape, the Cape of Good Hope. I'm just wondering what's the impact feeling, slightly going off topic, but actually on a, on a kind of a credible tangent, the impact of cruise liners not coming into Cape Town and the impact on the tourism industry there, and what are you seeing in the short term to remedy that, if anything? Yeah, it's a difficult one. I mean, to, to be honest, the, the hospitality and tourism sector has been devastated by the pandemic mm -hmm. in the Western Cape. Um, to the extent that, you know, uh, someone like the Tsoho Sun Group, for example, has, has kept their hotels closed um, since the last lockdown and have been forced to, to shut their hotels because it's a lot of infrastructure to operate, a lot of staff to pay when you have one bed night booked for the foreseeable future you know so um yeah. so the impact on on the on the tourism sector certainly as one of the anchor tenants of the western cape economy has been has been massive has been really yeah. beyond anything we could have expected um but there's a lot of very good work being done down here by cape town tourism by organizations such as westgro to really promote this region as a destination for tourists and and to 
alleviate some of the concerns that, that some tourists may have about visiting a place like South Africa. And we're starting to see a trickle of certainly American um, tourists starting to, to come through. Um, obviously, we're not getting much um, visitors from, from Europe and, and other parts of the world, um, but we're hopeful, you know, with vaccination really starting to gain traction globally um, and, and people feeling a little bit better about traveling, that, that we could see a return of tourists and certainly get that uh, cruise terminal um, operational and, and working. And I think in the themes of the last few weeks, obviously, we've seen the devastating riots, the looting. It's kind of highlighted the challenges we have in our infrastructure now, but actually the, the failing infrastructure beforehand. And I think it's a good opportunity to bring my colleague Lunga Sile in from the, uh, the chamber in Nelson Mandela Bay. And I'm going to link rugby. I spent yesterday with the new British High Commissioner. And we were really hoping to have a series of celebrations for the British Lions Tour, and which are now being played behind closed doors in the Cape Town, the Port Elizabeth Stadium, Quebecer Stadium was going to be utilised, Joburg, and obviously that's, that would have been a great boon for tourism uh, as the British Lions you know, sought revenge for the uh, English defeat in the World Cup in 2019. But Lungisile, maybe you can give us a, an introduction, an overview of how things are in Nelson, Nelson Mandela from a Nelson Mandela Bay from a chamber perspective. Thank you, thank you so much, Leon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, members of the Nelson Mandela Bay Business Chamber, as well as the, the British Chamber. Um, today, we will be talking about, you know, building water resilience. And Leon, thank you for that, where we've welcomed a panel that will be speaking to this. Um, and in the current state, the direst current state of the Eastern Cape, with the water levels really decreasing um, with um, so much. And we think that it's important to have these conversations where we talk about um, the water um, state of the bay. We've had a similar conversation um, in the previous year where we talk, we spoke about the, um, the water levels in, in, in the bay. And I think this is a perfect platform where we um, share to the members some insights to say that these are the possible solutions and we welcome that panel the, today. We anticipate that both chamber members will find it insightful and informative to actually engage with us today um, towards the end in, in our Q&A. So welcome to everyone. Thank you so much, Leon, for the opportunity. Thank you very much. No, thanks, Lungisile. It's great to be partnering with you. And again, reiterate that I think as chambers, we really do need to be an active voice in business and supporting the government in the developments that we need in order to enable our members to keep growing and keep surviving. Uh, I saw the Durban Chamber being very prominent in, uh, and vocal around actually looking for a, a, a booster indeed, of which we're members, looking for a 24-hour shutdown, which I'm not sure we would support here. But moving on to our next structured topic, not only are Cape Town and Quebec are two major port cities, but they also share challenges with water security along with many other South African cities and towns that we really want to deep dive into today. While Cape Town's dams are now looking good again, we can still recall the years of drought and day zero not long ago. Ryan, I know you were heavily involved in this and what lessons were learned in Cape Town and what were since implemented in terms of risk control, prevention, water saving strategies? Thanks, Liam. Yeah, I unfortunately drew the short straw on that one and um, was, was very much involved. Um, I, I think one of, and, and I don't think people realize just how close Cape Town actually came to a very real um, day zero scenario. It, it was literally a matter of weeks uh, based on, on our estimations as to when we would hit there. Um, what one of the, I think, most interesting things that happened was the city made the decision to create a Section 80 uh, Water Resilience Advisory Committee. Um, and that structure allowed the city to crowd in sort of all the relevant city officials. It was chaired by the MACO member for water and sanitation, um, crowded in all the officials at the coalface, you know, so the people who were actually tasked with working on water, but then also allowed crowding in of external experts um, from the universities, uh, hydrologists and, and so on, um, as well as individuals such as myself representing business and so on. So we, we ended up with a very, very interesting structure of all the right people around the table, which allowed us to, to really get a handle on, on what was happening and make sure that everybody understood. I say that, but obviously, you know, I'll talk about the politicians a little bit later. That's a separate issue. Um, yeah. But but the, the people required to work on that and really get us out of the mess were, were all seated around the table. Um, and actually, what, what we did since then was there was a very nice little bit of research that we did to actually determine what the lessons 
Lint were. And so if you, if you permit me, it, it'll take a little bit of time, but I'll, I'll walk you through sort of the four key areas Please that were, yeah. were critical. Okay. So the first one was to strengthen governance, right? And so this was really a number of aspects, but strengthening vertical governance between municipalities, province, and national spheres. I think the importance of those relationships cannot be understated. Um, and, and the strength of those relationships can either enable or undermine the, the flexibility and the responsiveness on the ground. You also need to strengthen horizontal management of water within the municipality. So transversal management um, to make sure that all various spheres and departments within the municipality understand what's happening. Um, and, and bearing in mind that, you know, when you change something in one of those areas, um, it can create undue uncertainty across the entire municipality. So it's absolutely uh, essential to make sure that there are strong transversal relationships. Uh, you need to build leadership uh, and capacity before a crisis, you know. So, um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that uh, in the Eastern Cape, you know, the lessons weren't really learned from Cape Town because this was something we realized too late that, um, you know, that when you're in crisis, it's very difficult to build capacity. Um, and so you really need to build that leadership capacity uh, before the crisis. And tension between political and technical leadership also um, really undermined the trust quite substantially. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later when we get to communications. Um, and then, of course, you need to invest in partnerships beyond city government. So, so much like you know, I've mentioned with the Section 80, where you had external experts, university experts, business experts, and so on. Um, I think that is absolutely important um, to drive those partnerships. But again, you know, it's difficult to establish partnerships whilst you're within a crisis. And it's far better to try and build those partnerships um, before you, you get hit by the crisis. And in the end, a lot of intermediaries helped uh, support the engagement beyond the city. And those were organizations such as ourselves who then step in to try and bridge the divide between the city and um, residents and business and so on. So, you know, the first point really, all of what I've just mentioned is around strengthening governance and um, relationships and, and so on between the relevant structures. The second lesson uh, or set of lessons, I suppose, was around data expertise and communication. So you really need to understand the local water system. The, the importance of data modeling and decision making was absolutely critical for everything we did on that committee because there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of um, speculation. There's a lot of media hype and, and a lot of noise in the ecosystem. So it's absolutely important that you have credible data um, that you can rely on for your modeling and your decision making. Um, you need to actively seek external expertise and experience. Um, you know, I think for, for a number of reasons, but, but also because it builds credibility, both inside and, and outside of the city. Um, and, you know, there were, there were various models of engagement that were brought to bear that proved to be quite successful. The, um, uh, the World Bank CSP program, um, the Section 80 committee that I've just mentioned, uh, and then even informal engagements, you know, to seek out experts, um, give them an opportunity to present to the right people and really engage to, to uh, try and surface potential solutions. Um, and then, of course, within all of that, you need to share information about the water situation and build public trust. Um, I think this was a, this was a real uh, challenge for us. Uh, the, the lack of information, and particularly in the public domain, creates enormous mistrust, you know, uh, from citizens, but also within the city and from people that you would be depending on to assist. Um, and the demand for information, incredibly high, you know, everybody is yeah. looking for credible information at a time like that. And so, um, it, it, and particularly for business, you know, it's very important for business to understand what's happening so that they can make a decision around, should we invest in our own wall? Should we put up our own diesel plot? Um, you know, and these are big investments that really require uh, accurate data and information. Um, so that was that was absolutely critical, um, the communication, the data and the expertise. The third lesson um, really then speaks to adopting a systemic approach. So absolutely critical to look at this holistically and embrace a systems approach to, to managing water. Uh, and there you need to consider the social, the environmental, the economic, technical, institutional aspects, and really appreciate the role that water plays across the whole of society. And, and also consider fit for purpose water. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, should we be flushing our toilets and watering our gardens with drinkable water, which is a really valuable resource, or could we supplement that with grey water and, and other 
um, uh, other forms of water. So really important to, to consider fit for purpose water and make sure that um, you know, the really clean drinking water is preserved for, for absolutely critical purposes. Um, you need to create a networked system of water supply. So decentralization of supply, absolutely critical. Diversity of sources, very important. But both of those have a significant financial cost and, and requires considerable support. Um, what we found happening in Cape Town was what we eventually started referring to as the rush to the bottom. And this was the practice of people sinking balls on, on their private properties. And, you know, the reality of balls is that you, you, the more people are sinking boreholes, the deeper you need to go to actually access the aquifer and uh, the water level. And so the quality of water starts deteriorating as you have more and more boreholes. But you also had this rush to the bottom where those who could afford to go deeper did. And, um, and obviously then benefited from, from the best quality water, whereas those who couldn't afford it um, were stuck with, with sort of less, a lesser quality of water. So very important to manage that because certainly for us as a city, it became very difficult to understand how many boreholes were being uh, put in place and what the impact of that might be on the, the broader aquifer system. Um, and then, of course, you need to recognize the limitations of the current financial model for water. So, um, I, you know, in the end, what, what saved us in, in Cape Town was the behavioral change. So we very effectively managed to convince people to reduce water consumption. But, but what happened was we reduced water consumption by 50 percent. Fantastic achievement. Uh, and we did that in 18 months, whereas Melbourne, a similar size city uh, a few years ago, took 12 years to achieve a similar reduction. So that was considered a win, but no one had considered the financial implication of that because if water sales are a key revenue stream for the city, uh, what happens when you remove 50% of that revenue? And in the case of Cape Town, um, water sales generated in excess of 4 billion rand per annum for the city. And by reducing that by 50%, it means there was suddenly a 2 billion rand hole in, in the budget. So very important to, to recognize uh, the limitations in the current financial model um, and consider the restrictions, tariff levels and, and so on in advance of the crisis. Very difficult to get that over the line when you're in the midst uh, of a crisis. Um, and then, of course, the, just the broader thinking around how water should be financed, I think, uh, warrants a lot of attention at this stage in South Africa. And then the final lesson um, was really just around building adaptive capacity. Um, so you need to develop a water-wise city vision. I think this, to, to, for me, this was the most important factor in preventing a day zero. And that was really driving this vision um, as a city of being water-wise. And, and what that meant. So a lot of material was developed to support cities around that, a lot of promotions and so on. Um, so, so absolutely critical to instill that sense. I mean, you know, I've, I've just spoken about the 50% reduction in water usage that, that we experienced during the crisis. And so to put it into context, we went from uh, around about uh, 1,200 million liters of water a day, and we brought that down to 600 million liters a day. So, you know, bang on 50% reduction. Up until today, we have not gone back beyond 800 million liters um, a day. So it's hovered around uh, 750, 850 ever since the crisis, which still represents a, what is that, a 33% uh, reduction in water usage across the entire city. And that is absolutely critical for long-term sustainability. Um, you need to also integrate climate change into your water planning. So again, I think the one thing all of us learned down here was you can't depend on historical projections and um, rainfall patterns, you know, because pretty much all of that got thrown out of the window um, and, and couldn't be relied on because climate change is real and it's impacting across the globe in, in very real ways. And so um, you, you need to factor that in and, and almost take a worst case scenario when, when planning for that. Um, and then lastly, I, I would say you absolutely need to strengthen the engagement between political and bureaucratic officials. You know, um, tensions between politicians and bureaucrats really reached an all-time high. Um, and you need to strengthen the understanding and engagement um, and, and the capacity of, of these groups. You know, we, we had the idea to implement the Day Zero, which, which I think everybody is quite familiar about and everybody has heard about Day Zero. Um, and it came about through our committee because 
at the time we were messaging sort of in terms of the percentage dam level percentage you know and we had a lot of boards up on the highways and pretty much everywhere we could get space to sort of say well today the dams are 38 percent and the next day it would be at 37 percent but we very quickly realized that people become desensitized to that and your average citizen doesn't understand what 38 percent means versus 42 yeah. percent and so on and so yeah. what we sought to do was implement a measure that really brought home for people the notion that if you continue using water irresponsibly this crisis is going to hit us and here's a countdown clock so it's in your hands to try and reduce your consumption so that was immensely powerful and effective but it very quickly became politicized because then of course you had um you know people will know that it's it's the opposition party down here in the western cape and then you very quickly had the anc jump on that and say well day zero brought to you by the da and so we literally had yeah. those posters going up in cape town yeah. um in anc branding um which then triggered a response from opposition politicians and we had the leader of the opposition come down to cape town and declare that day zero was done and they solved the problem this horrified us on the committee because as far as we were concerned <laughs> we were facing a speeding train that was coming at us yeah, yeah. and the one thing that was was slowing that train down was this notion that day zero was going to hit so for the politicians to then wade in and try and soften that message um was was quite damaging because it, it creates the impression that everything's going to be okay and and you can get back to it i think in the end what saved us to be honest was nothing that any of us did apart from the behavioral change stuff but it was actually the rain came um we we <laughs> we had of, lots of, of God. yes <laughs> yeah of absolutely God. Yeah. absolutely yeah. i mean we initially identified yeah. 17 potential sites for desalination plants all, all along the coastline but we learned some very interesting lessons so so firstly you can't have a desal plant if you don't have solid energy supply so you need 10 megawatts consistent energy supply which cannot be disrupted um so that effectively almost means a, an entire power plant of its own so there are very few locations that could actually secure that kind of power. But then secondly, you also need access to the water reticulation network. If you think of a, a blood transfusion, for example, you can't do a transfusion into a capillary or into a small vein. You need a major um, artery and it's no different for water. So for example, in, in the Western Cape, most of our dams are in high lying areas and it's sort of a gravity fed system to get water into, into the city, supported by the pump stations and so on. But what happens when you are creating the water at sea level and need to get it back into that reticulation system? So really critical to do a full analysis of all the existing infrastructure to understand how this new water can actually be introduced into the system in the first place. And then of course, the kicker for us came um, around water quality. So the, the quality of this, the water that you're desalinating needs to be um, fairly decent or desalination becomes excessively expensive and very difficult to do. So um, in the end, we ended up with one trial desal plant at the VNA waterfront, which was only meant to produce 2 million liters per day. So this was entirely just for the VNA's usage. But even that project has now ended up in court because the water quality was so poor that the contractor couldn't deliver the water to the agreed standard. And then it became a fight as to who was responsible for checking the, the quality of the ocean water prior to the tender process and all of that. And that whole mess has now ended up in the courts. So it, it demonstrates that if we had depended on a 500 million liter plant, um, we'd probably still be fighting about where to put it and who's responsible for it. And, um, it, it certainly is not something you can implement in the short term. I mean, I, I, I know Ivor has got some very interesting technology that he's been engaged in that potentially yeah. could be activated in the short term. But um, I think it's, it's, it's folly to think as a municipality that you could produce, you know, hundreds of millions of liters per day um, in, a, in a very short period of time. It's a, it's a very risky proposition. And as we've seen from experience in Cape Town, very, very complex and very difficult to implement at, at short notice. So funny enough, we, we did an analysis to sort of look at cost per liter and where we would get the most bang for buck. And surprisingly, what emerged as the best prospect was clearing alien vegetation from existing waterways. Um, it was the cheapest way to make sure 
that we had more water flowing into the catchment areas where we needed them. And it simultaneously created a very nice um, uh, employment opportunity for, for quite a lot of people because it requires manual labor and people to get into those waterways and, and literally just clear that alien vegetation. Yeah. Um, so that's quite a lot to digest. I'll, I'll pause no. there for a minute and um, we can no. pick up the conversation with the rest of the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. I know Ivor and yourself and myself, Cecilia, we've discussed much of this over dinner with other business leaders at our last in-person event. And I think I just want to comment on behalf of our members and indeed the Nelson Mandela Bay members, because I think it's really important that the voice of business speaks up and is challenging. And what I'm hearing is uh, when ideology and politics get involved, it really diminishes the efficiency to solve some of these societal problems. So I'm hearing about no data, which without data, how can we possibly make decisions? It's like, it's, it's like a military without reconnaissance, we are blind. Therefore, we're just sticking our finger in the air and it's a bit of a thumb suck. What do we do, that lack of data? What I find hugely frustrating is uh, we've lived through these, this in Cape Town and yes, politics always gets involved, but the Eastern Cape has not borrowed any of the lessons that were learned in the Western Cape, those hard lessons learned. And again, it just re remind me of the recent events around where was the intelligence? We knew on social media, these attacks were gonna take place. Infrastructure was gonna be hit. And yet, for some reason, we are blind, we are my myopic. So I think we have this, obviously, when ideology gets involved with solving problems, there's an issue. And this is where I feel very strongly that business has to come to the fore with these solutions. And we'll talk about Belaver, Belena and Ivor's technological solution. But I think it's really important that as chambers, yes, I work alongside the British High Commission, the Department for International Trade, and we work with South African governments to create a good environment for business. We want to encourage bilateral trade flows into the Eastern Cape, into the Western Cape, into Hauteng, into KZN, and the rest of the SADC region. It's so difficult to do that when you have these ideological issues and people are not learning lessons. Infrastructure is being attacked. Blood banks are being attacked. We don't have energy security, and yet we are still being ideological. So I'm just expressing that frustration on behalf of all our members in business, and many of you are on today. You're struggling to meet payroll. You're struggling to keep your staff safe. You're struggling to feed some of your staff, and we have to hear about ideology over what is, it, what, what is a solution that can be provided for. That said, I'm not a politician, I'm a businessman, and I want to hear what these business solutions are. And of course, in any context, in any environment, we have to navigate the politics and the government of the day. But hugely frustrating that politics inter intervened, but then that the lessons weren't learned. And I hope we can start to learn those lessons. Interestingly, I'm just going to put this out to the audience and again, encourage you just to comment in terms of what do we think are the main reasons for the water issues we've experienced? You know, Ryan talks about climate change. It is clear and present. It is definitely a factor. But do we have over-reliance on the dams? Is there a lack of leadership about the right decisions and actions that need to be taken? Are boreholes a good long-term solution? Is it our poorly maintained infrastructure? And I welcome your comments, particularly from our members in Nelson Mandela Bay. But equally, I think it's possibly all of the above. I know my colleague Ivor is gonna be itching to comment on much of this, and I'm gonna introduce him shortly, particularly around uh, when you're in a crisis, it's almost too late to train for that crisis. Like when you fall off a boat or you fall into a lake or a dam, it's too, learn, too late to learn how to swim. And I talk about some skills, you, it's like insurance, you never need it till you need it. These are things we need to prepare for. We know they're gonna happen. So we need to build up that leadership capacity ahead of the crisis. And Ivor, with your expertise and insights, I'm sure you're gonna talk to that alongside some of the challenges that you've encountered in the Eastern Cape. But Two months ago, the Metro consisting of Quebec, Carrega, and Dispatch, that housed 1.3 million people in a dire position with water supply. And not much has changed. They only have 1.5% usable water. And as of May, they had 4.5% left in the Cougar Dam. These are the lowest levels since 1957 and 1969. And indeed, the dams were last full six years ago in 2015. The acting director of infrastructure in the metro will have to distribute water from several sources to make up for the lost supply as the dam runs dry. The decision paves the way for city's infrastructure and engineering director to enter a partnership with the Cuega Development Corporation to proceed with plans to fast track the project, which will provide 15 million liters of desalinated water a day. Nelson Mandela Bay Municipality Mayor said the decision shows a clear commitment to invest in infrastructure. Now, I want to know the panels, and perhaps I'll come to you first, Ivor. What are the panel's comments on water sustainability in what is by no means South Africa's first urban water crisis? 
which touched on the management of water supplies, but also on the related infrastructure. I know you've been involved either in trying to engage with the Western Cape, engage with the Eastern Cape, but equally globally on some of these water solutions. What are your observations? Hello, Leon, thank you. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. I uh, just uh, apologize for the messy um, backdrop I have here. I've actually been in South Africa for the last five months and my 30 year old son had borrowed my office. Uh, I haven't had time to get done tidying it up. It was pointed out to me by Leslie. Um, listen, Ryan, Ryan has very eloquently hit the ball out of the park um, with so many of the points that he touched upon, you know, and, and I'm at risk really of, of repeating a lot of them. But, uh, you know, you talk about some of them leadership, um, absolutely leadership. Good leadership looks like good leadership, um, not just in a crisis. You know, you want that good leadership to be an enduring thing, not just somebody who steps up to the mark when 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 the chips are down. And um, uh, you know, and Ryan Ryan alluded to that. The problem with political leadership, I find, is they tend to think on a very short-term basis. You know, they look at the next four to five years, and it's about votes. It's about keeping themselves in power, as opposed to taking a truly strategic, long-term view of the problem. Um, and how to provide that enduring security and sustainability. And let's face it, water is critical. Of all of the, the key pr strategic pressure points that you're looking at, if you consider housing, if you consider food production, uh, energy availability, and then water, at the end of the day, the one thing that life will not be sustained without is water. And you require it in all of those other, because the housing um, industry needs water. power and production needs. You need food um, and agriculture is a huge user of water. Uh, energy, energy is a, again, has places massive demand of water. Energy isn't just produced without the use of water. Um, and then ultimately there's water itself. You know, the sustainability of ports, the, if we're going to truly bring development in, into South Africa and, and improve the economic forecast, we need to invest in infrastructure, not just the water infrastructure, but ports. You know, we, we are very closely involved in looking at risk factors for the development of the, the new city, the future city in Neom in Saudi Arabia, and also the port of Dukum on the Arabian Sea in the Oman. The critical factors for each of these, a start point for these is going to be how are we going to provide enduring water security, because without that, these things will fall apart. And they were in significantly water stressed parts of the world. So, you know, it comes to, again, looking at the climate and the interconnectedness of all of these things. We are looking at a long term strategy for water sustainability where the only certainty we have in these areas is that there will be more drought. We have no certainty about levels of rainfall or the dams catchment or how quickly th the water will evaporate in the dams, how long the infrastructure will hold out, we can extrapolate. But that one thing we are absolutely certain about is there will be another drought. It's part of the cycle in, in, in this part of the world. So really what, what I think is the, the initial start point of all of this and where it starts going wrong is the strategic planning for it the way in which it's done um, and understanding the interconnectedness of risk. And that risk isn't all just bad. You know, it's not there just to be mitigated against. There is, there's no uh, opportunity without risk. So it's where you can leverage different opportunities and how you have to plan around these things. And, you know, South Africa is used, uniquely placed in a position where it can seize upon those, um, but it needs to take the right risk management and strategic planning approach. And Ryan talked earlier about having all of these fantastic brains pulled in a room together. Um, I've seen a little bit of that in the Western Cape. When I was out there recently, we, I produced, and we didn't, didn't charge for it. We were a consultancy, but we didn't charge for it. Uh, we produced a strategic um, risk paper based upon the water situation and the long-term water strategy. And there's a danger there, and, and we see this a lot. Um, and we call it the, the tyranny of optimism, where, oh, the dams, are, things are looking great. They're at 95%. Yeah. So there's good rains at the moment in Cape Town, from what I understand, um, and people tend to become slightly complacent. And that really, when you've got those good rains and good water, is when you should be planning for when you have bad rains and yeah. bad water, and the droughts kick in when they kick in. And taking into account the fact as well that the immigration rates at the moment in the Western Cape certainly are between two and a half and five percent per annum. I'm not quite sure where they are in the Eastern Cape. So it's a, a, a holistic approach to all of these risk factors. You know, you need to be considering the physical. So what is the geography? Why do I say that? Well, simply put, the, the Western Cape and into the Eastern Cape is constrained in terms of its catchment by the Cape Fold Mountain Range. It has a dramatic impact where you can build catchment and how it works. And, you know, Ryan again was talking about the gravity fed systems, uh, the climate itself. And we talked about it and the fact that the only guarantee you have is that there will be more drought. So what? What do we do next? How do we prepare for it, for it and plan for it? And then the population fluctuations. So, 
there has been um, massive migration to the coastal areas. Tourism has been a big impact, but imagine the pressure of the, all those additional tourists on the water infrastructure that you have. Those things need to be planned into your, your long-term strategy. The infrastructure itself, absolutely critical. You know, your water pipes are creaking. Uh, the amount of wastage is astronomical. The difference between the way we do water here in the United Kingdom and water in South Africa is the high degrees of accountability here in the UK. Mm -hmm. I didn't see much accountability for the water leakage in South Africa. Whereas over here, you're fined for it. You're also fined for sewage going into natural water courses. Um, then there's sanitation. I'm going to use Nisa as an example here. Mm -hmm. You know, with fluctuating uh, populations, is they are equipped at the moment to treat 8,000 megalitres of sewage per day. And they need to be treating 10, actually closer to 12. That excess is, it's got nowhere else to go other than into the Nisa Lagoon or into the existing water courses, which means you start ending up with pollution and that will start polluting the aquifers as well. Then desalination plants, and Ryan's already talked to that. They are astronomically expensive. They take up huge amounts of ground space. So there may be solutions in some places. Um, they're slow to erect. There are very big environmental impact assessments associated with them. I think the fastest you can hope to erect one of those is usually around about three years, about a year for the EIA, the environmental impact assessment, about another yeah. two building. Enormously energy hungry, and they don't manage your sewage. They may provide you with fresh water, but you still end up with a brine pollution problem, and you end up with a, um, you know, a sewage. Where's the additional sewage being managed? And then dams. And you know, I looked at the, the, the water strategy paper and it's talking about the future water strategy for the Western Cape. And I'm talking about the Western Cape and I know the Eastern Cape is the focus, but because I've looked at the water strategy paper and it's, it's pretty efficient, there's a lot of great minds that come together, but they're saying that it's 95% reliant on dams and rainfall. So that is the one thing that has failed before that is now being relied upon not to fail again. Why wouldn't it fail again? Now the water demands and pressures are probably going to be greater when the next drought comes around because the population increases. Um, financial considerations, Ryan's talked about those, you know, it's water rates, it's what budget you have available. What are the costs associated with the different solutions? I've already said land-based desalination is enormously expensive. Does it create employment opportunities? You know, does it enhance your, your, your local um, economic opportunities? Environmental, uh, aquifers have been talked about. The one thing that wasn't discussed um, in the very good points that Ryan made, and I've seen this in Afghanistan. You know, we, we had a critical mass issue there where they were relying on boreholes and actually they were about to collapse the water table because, and, and that becomes an environmental catastrophe. And there's no reason why that couldn't happen in South Africa. If you start having to dig deeper and deeper and deeper to get to cleaner water, it's because your water table is lowering and you will reach a point where that becomes irreparable. The environmental damage being generated by that becomes irreparable. There's also, you know, a slight bit of, um, again, it's that degree of optimism. And I saw this in the Eastern Cape because in March, I went to the Eastern Cape desperate to discuss solutions with people. And I tried a number of diff different sectors from environmentalists through to media, through to uh, industrialists, even through and, and through to politicians. Nobody was interested in even having the discussion. Um, it was as if I was a cold call salesman and I was there. I do not represent any one organization out there, but what I do know is there are solutions and I know a good thing when I see it, and, I, and I'll come to that. Um, but nobody was interested in having the conversations. And those who can afford it put boreholes in, and they think they'll be fine. Those who can't afford it rely on the local authorities to try and sort out the problem. You know, Neutgedach Dam. At what expense are we trucking water from Neutgedach down to Kweberge and Kericha and those areas? And what impact is that having on the roads and the economy and all the rest of it? So, you know, this is not a viable long-term solution either. But what do those people who own boreholes think is going to happen when those who don't have water start running out of it? And this is why shortfalls of water are a direct cause of crisis in the world and conflict and will be in the future. You know, water is going to be a conflict point. Um, then you've got the environmental side. You know, uh, I've talked, sorry, aquifer, I've touched on already. There's sewage management, there's, uh, there's WASH, you know, the World Health Organization's water and, um, uh, and sanitation hygiene. There's the plastic pollution that's being pushed down through the water courses and, and in the sea and environmental impact assessments. These things all need to be considered, but also, as I said earlier, and as Ryan said, indeed, the interconnectedness of uh, all, all of these risks, how the one influences the other. Reputational, this comes down to politics a little bit. It's about the provision of services uh, and the strategy. You know, the ultimate 
um, expectation of a government and local authorities is to look to the security of its people. And water is absolutely fundamental to that. What yeah. strategic security are you providing downstream? And then we have the UN Sustainability Goals and every city and, and every region and every authority talks about trying to meet the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The, 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 the platform I'm going to talk about briefly is actually meets 10 out of those 17. Um, desalination plants, I can tell you, meet one, and that is the provision of clean water. And it sounds like in Cape Town, not even the provision of clean water. And then, you know, I don't want to labor the point too much. You've got operational risks relating to the solu these solutions. You've got to consider the certification and durability, the maintenance, what hazards does it, uh, does it bring with it? The commercial side, procurement is always an issue. Um, tourism was talked about earlier and the timelines of delivery. You know, you're in a crisis now in the Eastern Cape. How soon can you start providing immediate benefit solutions? And then there's a multitude of other factors. So, I, you know, I talked earlier about the role of, of energy production and electric yeah. power generation consumes more than th 3 trillion gallons of water globally per year. It's enormously expensive. Um, the role in food production, uh, here's an example, I'll pull these off the internet, so forgive me I, I, if I glance off the side, but one kilogram of chocolate uses 17,200 litres of water to produce um, in the commercial world. One kilogram of beef, we all love our beef in South Africa and our bright place, but one kilogram of beef requires over 15,500 litres of water for that one, uh, and we all love our wine in the Western Cape, right, 250 millilitres of wine, 190 litres of water. These have got to be factored in, you know, the commercial elements of this. And um, I, I've, uh, I've just, just an observation, I jump in there and it really does trigger lots of thoughts and lots of kind of things we've seen in the recent weeks. So in South Africa, we've, we're faced with crises regularly and then we celebrate the response. You know, I remember flying down to Cape Town and we were all invited to buy water at the airport and fly it down in our luggage to Cape Town. Today, we're quite rightly celebrating the cleanup on the N3 and in KwaZulu and town Hauteng. But at what point do we stop celebrating the way we react to the crisis and start criticizing the lack of foresight that leads to these crises? We're always going to be resilient and robust and rebuild. But at some point, and, and I know from your background, you've dealt with extreme risk. You've dealt with nuclear risk. You've been on counter-terrorist operations in Iraq, Afghanistan, hostage rescues around the world. At what point do you have to say, actually, there'll be nothing left to clean up if we do not start addressing these fundamental strategic challenges? Yeah, no, it's it okay. sounds... I, and I, I'm just so you were there in Eastern Cape providing a solution and nobody was listening to you. And this is, again, your, your sense of optimism, but equally what needs to be done and what are the risks we're facing if we don't do that now? Yeah, I, look, you know, four months ago when I was there, there could and this, this platform that I'm talking about, it's it's called Belena or Shore Utility Platform. Yeah. As I said, I, I am I, I do not work for Belena. So, uh, you know, there, there, I, I have. Um, I've no bun in, in uh, no dog in this fight. It's probably a better better analogy, um, other than to represent something that I believe is innovative technology that provides a solution. Um, it's a you know consider first of all um, how do we how do we take the how do we provide that long term water security from the only large scale guaranteed source of water, and that's the oceans. How do we do that in such a way that we bring no environmental damage with it? How do we make it something that is environmentally um, practical and beneficial and also affordable to the end users. Um, and how do we do this in the shortest possible time frames and create local uh, economic employment? And I don't believe there should be any one solution. I don't think anybody should be coming along and saying, if you build a, one of our desalination plants, that'll solve all your problems. There is no single source solution to these problems. It's a holistic approach. Again, what Ryan was saying, that needs to be collective and cohesive and coherent in its output, its delivery, its complementarity. So these platforms are floating um, offshore water platforms. They're made of concrete. They have to float. They don't sail. So there's no steel involved. There's no rust involved. They use entirely 100% green energy driven uh, or, or green energy taken from the sun, the sea, the waves, um, the currents, potentially uh, the wind all fixed onto the different platforms and they provide a desalination process onto the shore. But more importantly, they also manage the sewage coming back in. And what they do is they take it through a very technologically innovative process to ensure that not only is the brine managed to, um, uh, uh, to mix with the, the, the clean water that's, that's, been de uh, um, that, that's been sanitized going back in to the ocean, 
you're taking you're, you're creating an equilibrium with the ocean the guys who've designed this are, are experts from the royal navy offshore oil and gas platforms merchant navy and they've designed something here using existing technology put together in, in, a, in an innovative cohesive um whole to provide solutions for coastal and um, island communities and the thing is if you're feeding it into your water infrastructure and your system it offsets the pressures upon your catchment areas so it may be providing a coastal community but it may be taking a lot of pressure off the more inland communities that are relying on similar sources of catchment um so you know it's a, it's, it's about how you how you bring these to bear and you know you were talking about leon how the accountability and making people aware and how you do the long-term piece and I, I nearly took myself down a tangent where i forgot about that but um i think that's where things like the media come in it's about generating the situational awareness for those people who are going to be the ones suffering if the water is turned off who are going to be in demand who are going to have to be queuing for water that's being trucked in from water who are going to be paying enormous amounts of additional rates potentially to to cover the costs associated um so i think there is a it's influence operations and there's a significant campaign of media operations that's need, that needs, needs to be associated with if there's sufficient yeah. situational awareness if people know what the what the solutions are then they can start applying pressure to their politicians and the greatest degree of pressure on politicians is over the next elections and their jobs and therefore it's going to come from the people that they represent and on whose votes they rely um bit so, of a I mean, no not at all not at all over that's and again thanks to you and ryan it's really insightful and it, it is a real cause for concern because we are I might have a British accent, but I've been in this country nine years. I raised my children here. I'm heavily invested here, and I want this to be part of the future. And this last week, how many people have been saying, how do I get a British passport? How do I get a visa? How do we exit? And I think we, we have to have significant people on the ground addressing these problems. And what can we do as a chamber business community? Influencing operations, influence operations, absolutely, we can do that. And I think we need to do that with hard data, with hard facts, respectfully and robustly. And not just sitting around holding hands saying, aren't we great at tidying things up? Actually saying, well, yeah, we'll do that. But what about the problem and the poor decision-making and lack of accountability that got us here and making sure our stakeholders know all about that? Either Belena seems to me to be a win-win solution for societies at large, for municipalities, for business. Do you have some examples of where that's been deployed successfully and how we can perhaps collectively start to influence our coast or littoral communities to introduce these concepts as you say they could be part of a mix that is the solution okay so the um the Belena offshore platform uh is put, it spent the last six years in trials and development so the research and development is all done um and these are all existing technologies brought off all those different types of platforms that have as i said been brought together in a holistic package and you get your 100 percent green and renewable energy is being used so there is no any there is no additional energy demand in fact it's a net energy generator. So it provides additional energy from its processes that can be provided to the shore. So there you have something that's not just self-sustaining, but that is also providing to the shoreline, to, to the users on the, on, on, you know, on, on the shore. Um, it provides clean water from the sea. And, and this includes splitting out things like plastics and microplastics. So, you know, your water quality is assured. Um, it has a, a, a significant reverse osmosis process and filtering process on board. And you can even add nutrients into it at some point. So you, if you've got a lack of fluoride in your water, you can add fluoride in at that particular point. And then it manages, it can manage the sewage going out as well. And it's got a very clever system. I'm not an engineer, so don't ask me for specifics or details, but there's an internal combustion process um, that heats the way, all the waste, human waste. Um, and that includes, you know, the worst types of human waste that you can think of or waste from the shore. I'm, I'm not going to go into gory details, but it combusts it internally. And that generates additional energy, which goes into a storage capacity and then gets piped to the shore. And um, you might ask then at that point, okay, so you've got a combustion process. Of course, there is going to be uh, pollution coming from any kind of combustion process, right? So there is about a 1% well below the, um, the, the World Health Organization and the UN and environmental expectations. Um, but most of that internal heat that's created generates that additional energy, which is harnessed and stored. You do end up with ash. But through the maintenance process, that ash can be used for fertilizer. So hence why I say you actually end up with a net environmental benefit for, for this particular platform. Where is it being used, you ask Leon? Okay, so it's something, and, and timelines I said earlier were important. If you want to bring, if you want to construct, and it's done locally, so you know there's local employment opportunities associated with it, but it is done in such a fashion uh, at, to, to be able to achieve full environmental um, uh, uh, compliance that takes 18 months to produce, okay? 
That's not going to work right now for Poperche. Uh, but there is a hybrid model which takes four months. Okay, that four, within four months of being signed off, that can be producing fresh water, four to five months at a push. Um, the only drawback to that is the fact that then you're relying on generated power. Okay, so it's going to be using diesel power. However, that's an emergency in extremist solution. Over the longer term, you then build the green infrastructure around it. So that 18 months downstream, you take it off the generators and then you're providing, again, that 100% green and renewable energy to run it. Okay. Um, ultimately, if you compare it to other solutions such as, as trucks bringing in water uh, or building land desalination, the energy uh, impact is going to be a lot less than, than other solutions. Uh, and of course, yeah. you know, the other reliable sources of water is water from air. And, and there are technology, there's trials and development ongoing at the moment. And there's a South African involved in all of this. Um, it's called the Mayan project, which will also hopefully downstream start to be able to produce that water from air with no environmental impact. So, you know, there are multiple, that's what I say, it's got to be a toolkit of solutions with people from yeah. every single person on this call this afternoon is a stakeholder in this process. You all benefit from the water, whether you're business or industry. And I know we've got an eminent reporter in uh, attending today from, from the Eastern Province Herald. You know, it, it's upon all of us to generate the awareness, to look for the opportunities and to contribute towards the strategic planning and the outputs associated with this. No, thanks, Ivor. And what, what I'm hearing from you and Ryan, uh, we, we've got solutions that uh, really shift the dial on our sustainable development goals, but easily create local employment at a time where we really need it. I think it's a good opportunity to go to the, uh, to the audience here. My colleague Cecilia, are there any questions you'd like to raise or comments from the, from the audience? Just one apology. Sorry, I've been jumping. Yeah. I, I did fail to answer your question. Where is it being considered at the moment? It's under negotiation sure. production with yeah. the Sea Isles, uh, the Philippines, uh, possibly Neom in the Red Sea for the Saudis, um, yeah. uh, in discussions with Trinidad and other parts of Africa, um and uh where have i forgotten my uh, oh gibraltar yeah and they've actually worked out in gibraltar um the cost of water for the individuals there is going to be cut by 50 percent. but of course the local politicians control that so ryan back to your point then about lost income to local authorities as long as the local authorities are controlling that they control the water costs as well you know? and this product comes uh, capex free so there's no initial outlay not opex free but the opex gets worked out with a local user and gets budgeted in over a you know a, a long Truly strategic period. Sorry. No, no. no, no thanks, Ivan. And interesting, I, I know I'm envisioning these parked off for the heads in Meisner, Plettenberg Bay, Simonstown, uh, up on the coast in Angola, that's solving solutions, creating local employment. Cecilia, what's our audience saying? Yeah, I've got two questions that, um, that I'll address. I'll start with one. Thank you, Charles, for saying thank you, Ryan, for your insights. Charles is also involved in climate resilient uh, infrastructure development. Um, so very much um, could, well, shall we say, commiserate with some of the challenges that you've had with Cape Town's Day Zero. Um, but before I get into how public sector one question, um, if you can maybe, Ryan, just, um, and either you as well, I think, particularly looking at the LENA, if we've got nature-based, natural-based solutions um, to most of these problems, particularly you mentioned uh, the removal of alien species, you also spoke about a water fund. Brian, if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on that, and Ivor also, if you can explain um, basically how the LENA is a very environmentally friendly uh, solution. I know you've mentioned a few things, but I think again, speaking a little bit more to that. Cool. Yeah, thanks Thanks for the question, uh, Charles. Um, yeah, nature-based solutions, I, I cannot recommend them highly enough. I think what, what happened in Cape Town was we had sort of a rush to desal, right? And everyone sort of punted this around as the solution. Um, but there are a couple of very significant dangers associated with that. And I think I've touched on one being brine. And so what, what we discovered was, you know, brine is nasty stuff. It's sort of the, the heavily uh, saline byproduct of the desal process. Um, and it's denser than ocean water. And so what happens is a common practice is to just um, pump that straight back into the ocean, wherever the desal plant is. But what we found is that that brine literally settles on the surface, it sinks to the bottom. And if you don't have sufficient current and um, flow and refreshing of, of that particular bit of ocean, um, it, 
pretty much kills everything on that ocean floor. Um, and you, you end up with an ocean desert in that region, which is obviously uh, not ideal, particularly not in a place like um, GQ, where, uh, you know, fishing is a key uh, part of your economy, a key part of the local economy. You absolutely do not want to damage um, any of those prospects. So, um, so definitely where possible, you know, nature-based solutions should be uh, prioritized um, and, and there should be an element of caution in rushing into many of these solutions. Um, one of the other areas that um, massively, that potentially could be massively damaging is the uncontrolled sinking of boils and uh, tapping into aquifers. Again, something that Iva mentioned. In, in Cape Town, we mapped the aquifers and, and whilst we were very aware that the Cape Flats aquifer was, was seeing a lot of uh, pressure, we tried to protect the Table Mountain aquifer. It was initially proposed as a potential solution because it's a substantial aquifer, um, you know, in the Table Mountain region. But the problem was we just simply didn't have enough data and understanding about that aquifer. So, for example, if, if you are extracting water out of it, how is the aquifer recharged? And is there danger that extracting that volume of water out of the aquifer so close to the ocean would suck in some of the um, ocean water? And in that instance, that aquifer would be permanently destroyed and lost. And so you need to be exceptionally cautious when you start tapping into those sorts of resources to be very clear that it's not going to have um, a knock-on uh, ecological impact. Uh, anyone that, that wants to understand just how damaging that could be, have a look at Mexico City. Mexico City has traditionally gotten the bulk of its water supply through groundwater aquifers. And it's actually reached a point in Mexico City now where portions of that city are starting to collapse. But the, the ground is literally becoming unstable uh, because so much of that aquifer has been extracted and they're literally um, suburbs in Mexico City where the roads start doing this um, because the ground is becoming that unstable. So, you know, if, if you really want to see just how bad that can become, uh, read up a little bit about what's happening in Mexico City and just how dire that situation has, has become. So um, the, the Cape Town Water Fund, to be honest, it, it, it never really got going. I, I think also for, for, for any municipality, you always have conflicting needs. And, and sadly, you know, we, we've spoken about it, I think at length today, but we have a lot of people in government asleep at the wheel um, who are purely reactive and, and wake up when the crisis is upon us. Um, and so what that means is that you have a government administration that is consistently lurching from one crisis to another um, and rapidly reprioritizing budgets and shifting funds around and so on. Um, <laughs> And, you know, South Africa seems to be a country that it perpetually lives in crisis, you know, if it's not a water crisis, it was the COVID crisis, and now it's the, the, the looting and the violence. And, and so we lurch from crisis to crisis, always needing to reallocate budgets and always needing to reprioritize. And, and one of my biggest concerns is that in Cape Town, we've taken the eye, our eye off the ball completely with respect to water. Now, nobody's concerned about water anymore because you sort of see the report, you, it's wet, it's raining. You see water, you hear report that the dams are getting close to 90% again, and everybody forgets that this is a problem. So uh, again, just to, to, to emphasize the importance of making sure that people understand uh, where water comes from and how water flows and managing that perception is absolutely critical. You know, far more important than however many desal plants or other structures you could build. Um, people need to understand water doesn't come from a tap. Right? It, it, it's a system and everyone has a responsibility to protect that system. So, um, you know, that is, that is absolutely critical to make sure that that behavioral change is sustainable and people really start viewing water as the, the precious resource that it is. Thanks, thanks Ryan. Any, any comments from you, Ivo? Yeah, look, I couldn't agree more with Ryan on the, uh, on the natural solutions to these problems. Uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, just for a little bit of context, I, you know, even though I spent the last 25 years in, in, in the military, prior to that, I studied um, zoology and botany at the University of Port Elizabeth, as it then was. So I had a lot of experience in the Eastern Cape where we did environmental impact assessments and the rest of it. And what you have to be careful of is, you know, a lot of the problems we have in South Africa today um, in the environmental field actually come from biological solutions that we introduced into the country. For example, in the Eastern Cape, we have the acacia longifolia brought in from Australia to help stabilize dune fields, but it had no natural predator and it's 
run away with the, the, the you know dominating the vegetation in the eastern cape it has to be physically cleared with chemicals i think in many instances or burning to get rid of it um clearing of uh, non-indigenous um uh, flora such as ryan is advocating it's expensive but it's important it's absolutely critical you know the clogging up the waterways but it still doesn't then solve the problem of if there's no water running down those waterways because the droughts are so severe so ultimately the more green you can keep your solutions I, i'm all in favor of um, you will at some point ultimately have to probably rely on technological solutions. So if you are, then I think it's, again, it's associating that with your environment um, and how you minimize any form of environmental impact upon those particular technical solutions. Ryan, it's, um, you know, so agreeing with you entirely, just thinking what that next step might be in terms of where it isn't sufficient. And uh, just a, and a point to add also is um, one estimate that I think really, brought home the point for us uh, with respect to how valuable natural resources are, was that when we did eventually get the rain that, that saved us, it was estimated that if we had built the 500 million litre diesel plant and we managed to get it operational, fully operational, and you ran it for a solid month, you produced an amount of water that was equivalent to two, less than two days of rain. So in less than two days of rain, we got as much water as we would have gotten from running that desal plant flat out for a month. So, so that was really a very interesting um, statistic for me because it demonstrated actually the importance of preserving the natural resource, capturing as much of that water as we can and preserving as much of it as we can, as opposed to trying to introduce um, our entire need through external or, or supplementary um, methods, you know, you, you're always going to need um, the natural resource and you need to protect that and make sure as much of it is captured and used as possible. Uh, we, we also have a situation in Cape Town where we have a whole network of tunnels that run underneath the city and it channels rainwater into the ocean so that the city doesn't get flooded. Um, it's estimated that anywhere between 8 and 15 million litres a day uh, literally just runs off through that system straight into the ocean. Uh, we, we looked obviously at sort of the notion of whether we could capture that. And, uh, but again, the, the challenge is it's just been so poorly planned. Um, the reticulation system has been so poorly planned uh, that the cost of actually capturing and getting that water back into the system uh, far exceeded um, any sort of viable scenario. And so in the end, we had to make peace that during a day zero or potential day zero crisis, we had 15 million liters of water running into the ocean from under our feet. Cool. Um, thanks for that, both to Ryan and Ivor. Um, a final question um, that's basically, I'm, I'm actually going to pose this to all of our chambers as well, and also going to draw on what Guy Rogers from the Herald is asking. So we, we do see that there definitely needs to be a better better working relationship between government and industry. And I think we all want to know what is what can we do as representatives of industries, as Chamber of, of Commerce, as Accelerate Cape Town, what can we actually do to try and strengthen that relationship and get to some sustainable solutions? And if I can maybe have some just two comments also from each panelist, what can the chambers do? And particularly, what can Nelson Mandela Bay Business Chamber do what do you think can PE do right now? Just two things that we're not yet doing that we can do to, to kind of shift the dial already. I, I would say that the most important thing and, and certainly what saved us was the behavioral change. So you need to be messaging. You need to be ramping up your messaging campaign. You need to make sure that every citizen understands uh, how critical this resource is and the importance of saving it. I mean, we, we had a rush of people buying Jojo tanks and putting in gray water systems and all of that, but you also have to be aware that as you ramp up that communication, you also need to manage the response to it. So for example, gray water is a very dangerous thing and you absolutely don't want anyone's gray water to find its way back into the reticulation system. So, you know, the, the one-way valves and all of those sorts of things which need to be part of the regulations mm -hmm. governing how grey water systems are implemented and all of that, absolutely critical. Um, and, and, and bear in mind, as business, we have probably the best opportunity to manage behaviour and perceptions with our own employees, with our own staff, with our own customers and through our own communications channels. And so that's certainly 
um, is a very, very powerful way for business to support the municipality. Um, but of course, make sure you've done the work in advance to ensure that the messaging is consistent. Um, and so that everybody's messaging the same thing and everyone agrees to the message that's going out and the impact and the likely impacts that that messaging will have on behavior. So certainly in the short term, um, I would say that is, that is the most critical. And then secondly, um, something that became very important was maintenance of existing infrastructure. So we actually got to the point where we mapped the entire reticulation system and identified all the potential fail points. Turned out we have 6 million of them. So those are all the valves, all the connections, all the likely areas that could spring a leak. Because also what, what you really don't want whilst you're messaging to people about how precious water is, is to have a big leak in your main road that the municipality is not attending to for days. And so um, absolutely critical to, to map those potential failure points, make sure the teams that service them, you know, we had to move them to 24 seven hours and, and you know, they, they, again, the overtime that kicks in can be quite expensive for the municipality, but we simply didn't have a choice. We didn't have enough teams to make sure that all of those potential failure points could be managed timelessly. So, you know, these are some of the things that the municipality can do right now in the short term, and some of the things that business can do right now in the short term to support the municipality in this, because ultimately there's, there's no point assigning blame at this stage. You know, there'll be lots of time for that after the fact. What, what you really need right now is for everybody to pull together um, and, and get yourselves out of this mess. Yeah, that um, guy. That is the crucial question. Um, you know, what, what, what do we do? What do we do next in in, in a place like the Eastern Cape? And um, I, you know, I agree again with what Ryan has said. And I think you know, I would take a multifaceted approach to this. The first of all is yourselves in the media guy, and I think the environmental uh, aspects is, is part of your bread and butter. Um, I, I remember reading one of your articles about the Arab elephant waterholes. But the um, this is this is about creating that awareness. This is about exposing to people what some of these opportunities or options solutions might be to this problem so that they start applying pressure to their politicians you know if these opportunities are out there why are you not doing anything about it at the same time it will require a multi-sector um, stakeholder working group so this is stakeholders from within government and without this you know, and it's bringing together expertise but then you need somebody to coordinate and oversee this. And that shouldn't lie with any one single element of government or any one single element, I think, of, of private industry, because then it starts becoming a self-seeking um, uh, element in the, in the stakeholder working group. And that's where I think third parties, you know, and it may be um, somebody with expertise in pulling that kind of thing together in strategic planning. But then you need to be, you know, not just going, right, what, you need to be looking at the short-term solutions, but also, you need to be doing a deep dive into all of the existing procedures. You need to be red teaming it. Something, it's a process where you really critically, and this one needs to be an outsider. You critically go in and interrogate all of the existing processes. You war game them. You see where they will fail, uh, where they can be reinforced, where they can be supported, where they can be further developed. You look for the holes and the gaps in the planning, the shortfalls, those things that haven't been considered, and you work together collaboratively to try and come up with that solution, which will fit with, and this is a difficult task because with multiple stakeholders, you're always going to get selfish interests, different interests, conflicting interests. But it's the only, it's the only thing I can see towards some kind of long-term enduring solution so that you ride the, the current existing crisis through because you have no choice, try and find short-term solutions. But at the next time the drought rolls around in five years time, six years time, you're prepared for it. Um, and as part of what you were talking about there, Ryan, you know, it's having, yes, it may cost a little bit of money, but actually, is this a spend to save moment where in the short term, it might hit your budgets, but in five years time, it's going to save you a huge amount of money in terms of, you know, what, I mean, I'd ask you guy or anyone else from, from the Eastern Cape, what, uh, what, what detail has the Eastern Cape gone into in terms of what the cost is, is going to be in terms of um, lost business, lost investment, um, the, the bussing in of the trucking in of water from Neukadat, you know, other environmental impacts that maybe haven't been foreseen yet that could have been prevented. There are going to be all sorts of associated costs with this that you, some of which you might know and some of which you won't even know yet, but they're going to start hitting you downstream. So it's how do you plan to prevent that? Yeah. I think Lungisile, I'll speak on behalf of the chambers and then I'll invite any concluding comments and just to, again, just to really thank everyone for their participation 
thanks Cecilia for feeding in the questions, uh, Leslie and Benice and Mission Control and Ryan and I have a really great insight. So thank you to our audience. I think as a business chamber, as a business community, and please excuse the metaphor, but when you are drowning, it's too late to learn to swim. And this is where we're in these crisis throws. Now we're drowning in so many ways, water scarcity, power scarcity, supply chains being disrupted, insufficient healthcare. At what point does business really intervene and say enough is enough? Uh, we, we have the capacity to pay tax. We have the capacity to educate our employees around the power of their vote. So people really understand the dire consequences of doing nothing and constantly drowning and then celebrating ourselves for throwing somebody a piece of rope to pull them out of the river when they're gonna fall in again on their own. We've actually addressed the problem, teaching people how to swim. So us as a chamber representing uh, British business, but all our members across the region. You know, I traveled to Kampala, I traveled to Nairobi, I, I was in Harare last week. We can see examples of good governance and accountability. We can see examples of bad governance and accountability around the world. The time is really running out for us to be an investment destination and sustainable economy society if we do not really start being vocal and robust in how we address these challenges. So yes, we'll join you with the media, we'll join Ivor and Ryan, and we'll, we'll speak very noisily about what should be done, what can be done, be it a Belena, be it another solution. And secondly, as leaders, we've really got to inform our employees and any other stakeholders we have the power to influence. And that's what we're going to do as a chain. We're going to be an, a voice to inform, not one of desperation, but one of saying, this is what we can do. This is what needs to be done. This is what will happen. As we saw last week, what can happen when we ignore data, when we ignore warning signs, when we ignore intelligence, and intelligence, be it around looting and rioting and insurrection, be it around water shortages or power shortages, peak oil, we are facing these real sustainable challenges in South Africa now. Not in five years' time, right now. And why I'm slightly frustrated is I've been here nine years, and we've been talking about this for nine years. So when are we going to take action? When are we going to see leaders take action? And when are we going to see business take a real robust, cohesive voice? Because we want to create a better society for ourselves, for our businesses, for our children. We're going to keep talking about these critical issues as a chamber, and we're going to keep bringing in great panelists like Ivor and Ryan. Thank you both again for today. Thank you for the audience's participation. By all means, let's keep celebrating those that are cleaning up South Africa, but let's not be distracted and forget about what caused those crises in the first place. And let's start holding people accountable and making the right noises. That's what we're gonna do at the Chamber. Looking forward to our next session. And uh, I wish everybody a pleasant evening and a safe few days, and hopefully we'll have enough water and power to see the British Lions beat the Springboks over the next three weeks. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.